Fenwick Racecourse on a Wednesday afternoon is no better place to introduce our next guest, Julia Ritchie. Julia is Vice Chair at the ATC and her mission is to strive to make racing accessible to the wider audience. Well, Julia, we're here at Royal Randwick and this is almost your second home. You've been involved in the racing and breeding industry for as long as I can remember. But what has been your first initial memory coming into the industry? First memory would be my dad buying um, our horse farm up on the central coast, which was Bangalow Stud. I was four and dad's logic behind it for us was for us to understand natural law. But if truth be told, it was because Dad and Tommy were best friends and Tommy sucked my father into buying racehorses and breeding horses. So we were, the, we were the beard as children for that. But otherwise, that was my first memory of it. And your interest has continued on from those early days of your father, Bill Ritchie, being involved in racing. Absolutely. I mean, Dad was right with the whole thing about natural law and having learn about animals and stuff and gives you the gives you the alternative to other things for dad it was always his outlet from business um, from there I, we ended up breeding with dad was a very successful horse breeder I worked at Inglis as, as a strapper got to know my generation who are now all running things when we were all kids um, and it went from there and then my dad sold the farm and that was a bit of a hiatus for me working out where to go next where did you go next uh, I wanted to give back to an in the industry and so that was looking at eventually going into racing administration uh, which got me to the board at the old AJC. Prior to that being a member of the club because when I said, asked my dad, what happens if you die and I can't get a ticket to the races? And his line was, you have to marry a racing man and at that point I went, hell no. <laughs> and the next day I applied. You were the first female to serve on the board at the AJC. What was the reception like when you first applied? It was, uh, well I have to say, very supported. Um, I actually went in and talked to the CEO before I did it and said, I think timing is right to do this now. Uh, he'd known me for a long time. Uh, it was the year, as I think I said, we said, Jack Ingham was retiring, so everything felt right about it. Um, I think I was the only woman who was going to stand at the time, which was sort of made it a more interesting election. I think there were eight candidates, including myself. Uh, but when I got in, the boys were great. Um, we first day there was the funniest experience I've ever had, where I arrived in there, into which had been a totally male enclave. Uh, they had never had real coffee there ever, so I bought real coffee and a plunger, which was like a drug. And the other thing is no female bathrooms within Kui. So what I did was re-art direct the boys' bathroom with flowers and hairspray and the whole bit. And the boys took the joke really well. One of them came out and said, we've got a crisis, we're out of hairspray, <laughs> which everyone laughed at. And they were lovely, and because I knew most of them anyway. So it was, I, again, I am a firm believer in timing also being right for some things to happen. You initially got on the board, what were the thoughts, what did you want to change or what was something that you wanted to really push within the uh, member of the boards? Well when we f I first got on the old AJC it was the last of the transition from the old, um, when the old AJC was regulator. So part of that was actually relearning how to be a club again in a lot of respects. It was about I think encouraging younger people to start getting involved, being a younger person at the time. Uh, and also women, I mean, not, not actually like being a feminist approach to it, but just it offers so much to an entire group of our society and we weren't targeting them well enough. Um, when I say targeting, it offers just great opportunities for whether it's as a member or owning horses or working in the industry. So that was part of it. It was re-engaging with members as well um, and also getting racing to re-engage with the community again because I think we lost that connection, uh, evident in crowd size where standard Saturday used to be 22,000, it was dropping to 14. Now, we may never see those glory days again, but I do think we need to re-engage with the community, which I think particularly the now ATC and most of the, nearly all the clubs are realising they have to do this. Talk, 
talk to me about the Canterbury Night meetings. They've been this raving success. You were behind the push to also have more participants in reuse Canterbury. The board's totally endorsed it. I think one of the initial um, powerhouses behind it was Matt McGrath, who's now the chairman. Uh, but it was a no-brainer, and it's been one that's been parked there as an idea, even from most of the old STC days, in a lot of respects. And uh, I think that's the good side of the merger, that you can actually holistically look at the whole place to see here's a market and a community we can be actively pursuing. So it's also a big area for now where there's a lot of new residents. It's a family community. Uh, the Friday night thing, even what we had over 6,000 people in January for one night, which is more than a Saturday. Uh, you go down there, everyone loves it. It's, it's great community feel. The food trucks are amazing. Uh, they're now actually watching the races, which is interesting. From the first time where mostly they weren't, they were keeping an eye on their kids and now they're actually turning around and actively participating in watching the races. And that's my memory of being a kid, of going to the races with my parents and having a great time. So hopefully that's the beginning of the next generation as well. Do you feel racing is in a strong position at the moment in New South Wales? Do you feel we're hitting the markers or improving, getting people back to the track? We obviously have great racing, but it's the it's the participation that we're looking to increase. And look, I've got to commend Race in New South Wales for some of the amazing initiatives that tweaks everyone's interest. No matter what, the Everest has captured everyone's imagination where it's the talking point over the water cooler. Uh, the Golden Eagle coming up will be the interesting one to see how, what traction it has in the market. Uh, they're taking on the age old great races, but then again, I'm a big, I'm a firm believer and love all the main big races, whether it's the Doncaster or the Derby. I mean, for me, my aspiration is still to win a Derby and a Doncaster. I've been very fortunate as an owner to win some others, but that aspirationally for me, even more so than an Everest, it's something about those great Blue Ribbon races that still do my head in. <laughs> <laughs> Female ownership. You've been own an owner in the industry for a long time. Yes. How do we encourage more females or more owners into the industry? Look, I think there's quite a good push at the moment when you look at the syndicators and you look at the trainers that themselves now are putting together more female syndicates, not necessarily driven to a series, whether it's Magic Millions or whatever. I do think they are putting more women groups together. I'm a believer that the women groups should all though be mentored by some of the existing ones. So rather than getting all newbies or the wives of necessarily, it should be actually, we take on the role ourselves that for everyone who's in a horse who knows what they're doing, get a new one in. And because that's how a lot of people learn how to like racing, is sharing that experience. You've seen a big push for women being involved in racing. What's your thoughts on that? I think, look, I think it's great. Um, I think it's, but it should be a push for actually also young people as well. We've got to re-engage with the next generation because our generation will start to age out. And we, a lot of us came into it because our parents loved it. I think we're now, we, we do a really good race day experience. And if they have a good experience, we're getting them back to do other days. Uh, um, I have nephews who, um, for one of them, I made his 18th birthday present was his membership and he brings his mates out to the racing, he's at uni, and it's amazing, they get out and they absolutely love it. We have a young members advisory panel which is trying to craft what we do to actually appeal to the age group. We could say, let's, let's do this, but we're an older head with that message. So to get their first-hand approach to it, I think is insightful for us on how we can build getting more young people to the races and keeping them. And what's been the feedback at those panels? The young member one has been good. It's starting off with the right approach to get them here. And it's not necessarily about having big parties and stuff, but having days where they can gather and meet each other and it's affordable. Um, given that we're looking at doing mostly punting forums to teach them how to punt more, um, as opposed to just doing it on a phone or learning from a tab or a bookie. Understand how it works because it's quite challenging and quite interesting. Uh, it's more education for them to come and visit the stables. Um, an issue has been for the younger ones is their observations of welfare 
and I think where the clubs can contribute to that is actually introduce young people to how well cared for horses really are. Racing looks in New South Wales looks as though it's in a really strong position with the inception of the Everest, mm -hmm. we have winks at the moment, we seem to be getting people back to the racetracks. Mm -hmm. Where do you think we need to be in 10 years to make sure racing has longevity? I think we've got a good start, which is good. It's making sure we're relevant all the time. By the way, that's not acquiescing to just become a party venue or anything like that. I think racing has always been part of our culture and community and it's ensuring that we are relevant all the time. What's the biggest thing that you love about this industry? Uh, to quote Sir Clyde Kennedy about my dad, it's the relationships. It's the friendships and relationships that have been forged since, well, starting as a teenager. Whether it's, we've all grown up together, whether it's been you know, Gay and Anthony and Graham Begg and the Mitchells and all that, we're that generation. But I value their friendship, I value their insights. Um, I love being part of something that big and feel like I hopefully am making a contribution. Uh, it's, it's, I can remember the same feeling I had when in, in the film industry, that one day I walked into some event and went, right, now I know I'm part of this, where up to then you think you're a bit of a cog in the wheel. Uh, yeah, so I think that from my point of view, yeah, that's the biggest thing. The wins have been amazing, don't get me wrong, and has had the losses. Um, <laughs> But it, it is the people that are along the way that I've got to become friends with and meet. I mean, it does expose you to an entire broad spectrum of people.